them over on Ustream so that the people who might be on my website can view me and I'm here with you guys. So um, I, I understand, I know, I trust that it was just an awesome time there in Chicago. And because, you know, the folks out of, you know, out of that area are just so wonderful anyway. So to be able to go over and to share, I haven't heard or this is the first time I've been really able to um, listen in all day. I was uh, at the hospital with my father. There was um, some dis additional issues this over the weekend, over the last week or so. I told you guys he's back in the hospital, so we've we've gone through some additional things, and uh, so I was there at the hospital and didn't have time to tune in and listen to all that was going on, but I'm trusting that all is well. So today, um, yesterday I had a chance to speak at um, the church here, and uh, that was absolutely awesome because while you guys were doing A Course in Miracles in Chicago, there was also... Um, the uh, big thing down at, um, I think it's called Revelation, that was at um, uh, Michael Beckwith's church out in California. And so there was, you know, a whole slew of folks that headed to California, while a whole slew of folks headed to Chicago. And so all over the country, there was this spiritual vibration that was going on, and everybody was able to participate in. And so it was no different for me. I had a chance to participate from my end over here, and that was good too. All right, so let me start off. Let me get myself in gear like I normally do. Um, oh, and and you know what? And and some of the sharing that I heard this weekend was just absolutely wonderful. Anyway, I see Lori is here, and so Lori, thank you so much for. Um, for your sharing that I had a chance to listen to yesterday. I didn't get a chance to listen to too many people, but um, from what I did hear, uh, yeah, Dub, they, they held it down just great while you were gone. Okay, so this is A Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The aim of the course is not to teach the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, to, at removing the blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposites. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened, and nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. So, ooh, I'm just so, 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 okay, so here I am. I'm excited all over again. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, so, so here, here we go, you guys. Today is no different from any other day for me. Um, I am always, like, at, um, have this curiosity about spirit and what spirit says to me and how it affects me. And so I come in here um, today with this, you know, this desire in my heart to talk a little bit about this idea of being able to stretch beyond where we have been before. Because I had talked about that a bit yesterday in the talk that I gave at the church, um, it was so interesting because we had, uh, which was unusual, we had some children or young teenagers that showed up to service. And um, whenever we have young people there, it's always like I feel this need to, um, like Dove always says, um, kind of shorten the time for them, you know, because I remember thinking to myself as I was growing up, I wish somebody had told me, blah, blah, blah. And I would go through this thing of thinking, I wish somebody had told me. And I'm wondering sometimes if people actually told me and I just not been able to hear it because of where I was in my life at the time. And so a lot of times I think that we get caught up um, we go through these lessons that it's unnecessary for us to go through if we would um, listen to those that are around us and take the advice or heed the advice. So I talked a bit about my um, 
adolescence, my childhood, and how depressed I was. And I don't know if that just goes hand in hand with being a teenager or what it is, but I was so like depressed. And I talked about how the real issues that I had, the, the problems that I had coming up were not so much about dealing with other people as it was with dealing with myself. And so if I wasn't in a place where I was feeling good about me, it didn't matter how other people saw me. It was that I couldn't get to a place of self-acceptance. And so it becomes this thing of how do we, you know, and, 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 and it's funny. Um, how many minutes on the mic? Um, am, am I? Okay, whatever. I, I, where you went to CSL, you studied, started by greeting the children and they went into an activity. Okay, so um, if, you're, if you're listening to me over the radio or if you are watching on Ustream, there is also a chat room that is set up where you can, um, you can also participate by getting into the chat room. All you have to do is go to ACMI Gather Radio dot org and there's a little thing in there that'll talk you through how to do it or if you just want to go to paltalk.com look up under um, chat rooms I think we're in other and it's called ACMI gather ACMI gather radio okay so um, anyway <laughs> so so there was this need that I had to tell them about you know where I am now and where I came from, because a lot of times when we look around at other folks, we see um, we see where they are now as opposed to the road that we've traveled in order to get here. And so I'm always talking about it in the sense that I came up like most of us do through one of those periods in time, one of those stages that was my ugly duckling stage. My, my, I was in a family where I thought I was the ugly duckling of the family and that um, I didn't have any talent, I didn't have any value, and, and I was constantly like putting myself down. And so it became this thing of me saying that this is a natural part of life and living, of growth. And so if that be the case, then then I need to grow and, and they will grow to the point of self-acceptance and self-love, which is a necessary part of where we need to be. And, and you guys, for some reason, it was so funny because people used to tell me that after the age of 40, you get a whole different perspective as perspective of yourself, of life, of, of your ability to care about what other people think. And so when you when you stop caring about what other people think, then you start to um, when you stop caring about what other people think, then you start to do what it is that you want to do. You start living from your heart space. And until you get to the point where everybody else's opinions about what you do and how you live your life, until you get to the point that those no longer matter, then you'll keep on with the, you know, with the drama that says, okay, this is not quite enough. So I say that to say, um, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Nothing outside this oneness and nothing else within. But, but the funny thing is, is that when you're in a space where other people's opinions matter more than yours, even though you know that, you can't get to that space. And so a lot of times, unless a person is brought up in new thought or in A Course in Miracles, unless they're there, it takes them a while to really embrace this. And so what we see is, is a lot of people coming to this at a, at a certain age or above a certain age point because before we're so busy trying to do what our friends do and do what those people are that are around us are doing that we can't get to a place where we're saying you know what this is what I'm going to do and this is what I believe during it and and I, I know even as I say that I hear myself saying that and I was thinking to myself that I was in my 30s before I actually started to branch out on my own 
and find the spiritual teachings that fit me. I'm not in my parents' religion. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I, they were raised Baptist. They're doing their thing. But now, I, you know, when I got in my 30s, I felt empowered enough to go out and seek and say that this is what I want to do. This is how I want to, to live my life. This is, you know, this is what I believe. And so I came to this awareness of what I believe. And then I went to search and find something that fit me. And so a lot of times when we're younger, we're just doing, we go to church with our friend or with our families first, and then with our friends second. And then we kind of don't stray along that thing because I, you know, I still have people at, at my age that come up to me and, and want to know where I go to church and who's your pastor. And, you know, as if I need to be pasteurized. And I'm thinking to myself, like, well, doggone it, I, you know, <laughs> I, you know I, I am. Darn it, I, you know, I've, I've, I've cut my own path. Like uh, Joseph Campbell would say, I've gone to the forest. I didn't follow somebody else's trail. I followed my own path. And so there is this, this this growth that comes out of just that and just that that process of owning my own my own beliefs my own ideas my own um religion if you will there is a power in that and so you know i don't need to i don't need to please everybody i don't need for them to um to understand although i would love for them to because that at a certain point it's like the happiness I feel, I want to democratize it. I want to make everybody feel the happiness and the excitement that I feel about my own spiritual path. And so it becomes this thing of just being released, being released to be free, to be you, to be loved, to, to experience life and not to be caught up in all that old stuff, you know, all the stuff in, 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 and all of it's oh, I mean, there's absolutely nothing under the sun. But I, I wanted to just find my way for me. So, I, and that's what I did. And so I came to the Course in Miracles uh, by, by a circuitous route. And now that I'm here, I'm always talking to people about the Course, the Course, the Course, the Course, the Course. So here I am. And so yesterday I was talking about this idea of stretching beyond the boxes that are provided for us. Um, as a matter of fact, they always record those services. And I was thinking to myself, if I could figure out how to do it, I could just play that like one day um, and, and have everybody listen to it. Because, you know, I like talking in front of audiences. And, um, and, and, and when you talk in front of an audience, it's like you get to watch faces and feed off of things and then and then throw out new ideas because you've now thought of something that you hadn't thought of before because you've got faces looking at you and it's just so cool when we when, you know when 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 I'm when I'm in front of people and I know I'm in front of you guys um but but not the same um it's not the same and so yeah it's all it's all it's all wonderful is the body in the past then is the body in the past then all therapy is a release from the past is the body in the past what body <laughs> what body you know um it's so funny that that uh you said that doc because um, as I was reading, you know, I'm still in my Joseph Campbell phase. And, oh, shucks. I'm, I'm still in my Joseph Campbell phase. And so today, it was so interesting because um, doo -doo -doo -doo. he says, um, I'm going to read this to you because I thought it was just, you know, because you just said that. It says, one way to come to the knowledge of a deeper you I'm reading out of Joseph Campbell's Thou Art That, Thou Art That, and I've been reading out of this book forever, it seems like, but I love it. I'm actually, yeah, whatever. So it says, one way to come to the knowledge of a deeper you is to distinguish, as they say, between the object and the subject of knowledge, identifying yourself thereby with the subject, the witness, and not with what is beheld. For example, 
I behold and know my body. I am not my body. I know my thoughts. I am not my thoughts. I know my feelings. I am not my feelings. I know I am the knower. I am the witness. And then Buddha comes along and says, but there is no witness either. You can back yourself out beyond the wall of space this way. And so we come to the realization of aspiration. Neti, neti, not this, not this. Anything you can name is not it absolutely. Ati, ati. It is here, it is here. This oxymoron or self-contradictory statement is the key to what we call the mystery of the Orient. Mm, don't you love that? Don't you love that? The mystery of the Orient. And so then he goes on and he's, hey, oh, let me, let me go ahead. Let me go ahead and read this next paragraph and then I'll let that go. However, it is the mystery also of many of our own Occidental mystics. And many of these have been burned by having said as much westward of the of Iran in all three of the great traditions that have come to us from the near eastern zone namely Judaism Christianity and Islam such concepts are unthinkable and sheer heresy god created the world creator and create creature and cannot be the same since as aristotle tells us a is not not a <laughs> Our theology, therefore, begins from the point of view of walking consciousness and Aristotelian, I don't know why that's so hard to come out, logic, where is it another level of consciousness and this, the level at which all religion must finally refer, the ultimate mystery transcends the laws of dualistic logic, causality, space, and time. You know, I, I keep telling y'all about how much I'm loving this book, Thou Art That. And um, and it becomes this whole thing of, of understanding that just because I'm consciousness, even in my awareness that I'm consciousness, I know that that all of me is so much more beyond all of that. And so as he delves into this question about the thinker and the, the, the thought and all of that, I, you know, I just get so caught up in, in stretching beyond what I even thought before. And so over, you know, I'll keep, I'm, I'll continue to explore and to try to like make sense of all of that. But even in that, I keep saying that anything that we could possibly conceive of that we think to be God. God, it has to be beyond that. So it's beyond these the level of opposites that we think about. So I'm saying for me, there was a time when I thought it was strange. I'll tell you guys, I thought when I was younger, when I was a teenager and stuff, I had this, this idea that, that there were these alternate worlds, these alternate possibilities. I'm going to get to the course in a minute. I, I thought that there was all these all, you know, alternate things, all these alternate possibilities that as I stood here, because I could only hear in a certain octave range or see certain colors on the spectrum, that we had to be living on this planet simultaneously with some other life forms that possibly stood outside of the vibrational patterns that we were used to. So even as I used to look down on the ground and see that little red bug that seemed to move effortlessly, I knew my world was different than his world, that my world was still different from the ant, even though the ant may, I may not be so big that it can't perceive me or think that I'm the jolly green giant coming out of someplace. But my world, because of where I was, how I am in the world, was different from its world. And so it became, as a teenager, I was thinking about all these worlds within worlds within worlds of possibilities of being and of experience. And in my world, yet in my world where I was, I may be a giant to something else, but where I was, I felt inadequate. 
I felt like I was not enough just as I am. And so I, you know, I, I adopted the teachings, uh, you know, whether it or not, it was the teachings I learned in school or whether it was the teachings that I learned in church that told me that I was this filthy rag and that I felt short of the glory of God. And so, so no matter else, whatever else somebody said, I was just unable because I was born, they said, into sin. I was unable to see my way to the person that I know myself to be now. And so as much as I, you know, I, when I go out and I talk to young folks, one of the things I want to tell them is in spite of all the things that they think, all the judgments that they hear constantly, whether it's from their parents or from their teachers or principals, whether it's from other students that are looking at them as if they're not, you know, they're not cute enough, their clothes aren't nice enough, or their hair isn't long enough, or they're not quite smart enough, whatever that frame of reference is, it's like, let me be the person that says, just as you are, just as you are, you're loved. And that you came here, when you came here, you didn't come here as a mistake and nor will you ever become a mistake no matter what anybody tells you, no matter how anybody treats you or how they see you or judge you. Never will you be a mistake. And I think that it's important that people get these messages, these lessons of love and of total acceptance that we hear on a regular basis. And here we are, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, and it's still necessary for us to hear. So why shouldn't it be necessary for our adolescents to hear the same thing? And so, yes, just as you are, just as you are. I mean, and, 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 and we have to always, I mean, you know, why not bear witness to that? Create that space for somebody else so that they can see the wonderment that they were created, that they were skillfully and wonderfully made, that they are here on purpose, that it's not a mistake, that they are here on purpose to do something wonderful. And so that was, you know, I, I got excited about that because I was thinking to myself, like, what does it mean? What does it mean? I was so busy trying to fit in the box. You know, when people told me, OK, this is the box that you're supposed to go in, the box that says you graduate from high school, you go to college, you, you know, you get married, you have children, you get the perfect job, you drive the perfect car, you live out in the suburbs. I was trying to fit into that box. Until I figured out that, darn it, I didn't like that box. I want my own darn box. I want to define it the way I see. And so nothing, nothing is wrong with wanting to live outside of the box. And so it becomes this thing of let us, you know, if, if, if we're really into this thing about, you know, uh, that you're a perfect child of God, if we're really into and feeling this, then why not say to people, you know what, let's do away with the box. There is no spoon. I, that's, that's my matrix thing. I got to do the matrix every once in a while. There is no spoon. And so then you will see that it is not the spoon that bends, but only yourself. And so, yes. So perfect, whole, and complete because God doesn't make mistakes. Yes, we have bodies to do exactly what Sandra is talking about. Amen. Doing and being, all of that, you know, because because it is, you know, I, I think that, that at a certain point, at a certain point, no matter what we know, you know, um, we may know, we may know that there is, I am not my body. I am not my body. I may know that on a whole nother level and on a different level than, than some may know. I may know that to be true, but until I really accept it and really, really am there, then, then I'm still going to be a part of this world of form that says, yes, you are. And so, yeah, so it becomes this thing, you know, let's, let's, let's then change. And so let's stretch. And what, what's required for us to stretch? What's required for us to stretch outside of the boundaries that we have? First, hmm, you know what? And, 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 and first, I think that it is a conscious awareness 
of the yes. Like, um, I who was that? Um, a famous Amos. Um, I remember hearing this thing of him saying that God is always saying yes to us. All we have to do is check our thinking. So if you're saying that you're not good enough, then you get the yes. But if you say that I am good enough, yes. If you say that I'm totally worthy, yes. Whatever you're thinking in your mind, God is saying yes to you. And so if you don't like your experience or what's going on in your life, then change around what you're thinking. Change around what you're thinking about yourself. Now, here's the other thing, because, um, you know, when I was talking or when I said, I don't know if I said it earlier or not, but we want to make this God, this this thing that we know is the allness, you know, this this thing that we can't even conceive of. We want to make this thing that we think of as God. Remember, I've talked about this idea that we have of God because, you know, even in labeling it and thinking that we know what it is, we 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 diminish or we we minimize all that it is. And so when we get past this idea, you know, when we increase or enlarge our, our idea of God, then we get past all of that the dual, duality thinking, uh, uh, past the opposites, past the male, female, past the good, bad, past all the judgments that we think that God is having. We move beyond that and past that. And so once we get past all of that type of thinking, then we can get into this thing of why, you know, if I'm here, why am I here? Did I sign up? Did I volunteer to come? Or was I kind of like, thrown down into this realm of, of being, into this, this world of forms? Was I just thrown here by accident? If I was thrown here, if I believe in a, an intelligent universe that knows exactly what it's doing, and I came here on purpose and for a purpose, if that be the case, then why am I here? What am I here to do? Is it possible that I signed up for this? Is it possible that my soul has a mission here? And so if I believe that my soul has a mission here, then how do I figure out what that mission is and how do I carry it out? And Joseph Campbell would say is by following your bliss, following what makes you happy, what makes your heart sing. And so, yes, it is, it is, you know, it is this, this thing of increasing increasing our awareness of what it is that gives us joy and makes us happy. What it is that, you know, that we're doing here on this particular level. So, um, you know, I was, I, I went through and I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking to these kids. And it's so funny because as I was talking, um, there was ideas that were just kind of like bombarding um, bombarding me and my consciousness and, and, and what I kept thinking that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of the things that I said to them was, is that we have this, um, this, this distrust in ourselves. So when, when Dove talks about, um, us, uh, developing trust, we have a natural tendency, and this is people, in general, we have a natural tendency not to trust. And the reason why we don't trust is because, and, and people do this, is because they've externalized everything. So it's either God made me do that or the devil made me do that. There is this disconnect when it comes down to knowing and claiming I and the Father are one, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's spread throughout, not just the earth, but everything you could possibly conceive of. The kingdom is there. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is everywhere present. Remember the quotes, um, split a tree or split a rock and I am there. Cut a tree and I am there. Whatever, wherever, in whatever it is, this, this, this 
presence, this energy, this whatever it is that we know to be God is there, present, fully present in that moment, wherever it is. And so it moves beyond this idea of good and bad, like it couldn't be in a prison as well as in a church. It moves beyond those separate ideas into this knowing that no matter what, God is present. Now, if we get to that point, it becomes this thing of, you know, if, if God is present and if God is active, active, you know, if it is the same God that had the ability to, from our stories that we've learned, it's the same God that had the ability to part the seas and to resurrect Jesus and to dictate the course and the Holy Quran and all the other books that are there that, that had the power to say, let there be light and to form man out of the dust of the earth. That's the same God that was then that is now. And so if that same God is active in and through our lives right now, how could we be in a wrong space? How could we have a wrong thought? How can we do something wrong? If it's the same presence that's always been, how could it be any different? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And so yet we want to judge up against it. We say that it is present in our lives, in our hearts, in everybody that we see and we meet. And yet and still we judge. I don't get that. I don't get it. So, so here we are. Here we are. And we're here on purpose. We're here by divine order. We're here. We're here. And so it is saying to us, yes, now dare to think bigger. Yes. And, and, and even bigger than that. Yes. And even bigger than that. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Whatever. Yes. And keep expanding and keep growing because you are playing too small. Oh, isn't that something? I mean, if we all recognize that we have been playing too small and not playing at the, 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 the edge, the edge of our comfort zone, the edge of possibility, the edge of where we could go. And so even, you know, even, even back in the day when, when the Bible was written, when Jesus walked the earth, he was there trying to live at the edge or living at the edge of what was possible and saying, hey, see, come on out here. So whether it was when he walked on water, according to what the book says, when it was whether or not it was when he walked on the water or decided that he was going to lay down his life so that you guys can see something different, that was living on the edge. And so what isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, greater things, greater things than these can you do? But you won't because you don't believe. You don't believe in yourself and your own abilities. You don't believe that you're ordained to be who you are, to be where you are, that, that God is truly saying yes to you. You think, oh, God really wants me to stay in that box because that's what you've been taught. You've been taught that somebody wants you to stay in the box. But you have already, you have already gotten the yes. I'm telling you now, if you didn't know, I was supposed to come and tell you today that the answer is yes. No, did you hear me? The answer is yes. What was the question? Ah, uh, from the matrix, right? It is the question that drives us. The answer is yes. So, um, so, so, and here's the other thing that I want to make sure that I tell you guys today. I know you don't need this lesson, but I need to give you this lesson, whatever it is. I, I need to say it. You don't need to hear it. I need to say it. Um, you, this is not something that you need to earn. You don't need to earn the yes. You were born with the yes. Remember um, from your old teachings, wherever you grew up and learned, remember from that teaching, they said that grace is the unmerited favor, unmerited meaning unearned favor. You have the yes simply by virtue of you having life, of you being life, of you having breath, 
of you being in this space and time. You have the yes by virtue of your oneness with your brothers, or of your oneness with God. You have the yes. You don't have to earn it. So you don't have to wait until you stop smoking or lose weight or get married or get a degree or 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 what. I mean, None of that stuff. You don't have to wait until you stop drinking. You don't have to wait until um you 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 graduate or till you get a new car. The answer is yes right now, damn it. Right now is yes. So huh, yes. Whatever question pops up in your mind, yes. No. If you're asking me, is it too late? No. It's not too late. Right now is the time. You are the person. This is the day. I am the person that was sent to you to tell you, yes, it's not too late. So yes, right now. <laughs> yes, right now. Right this very moment. Right this moment. Um, hmm. So, so, so yes. Um, so, <laughs> so, um. You know, it's funny because I was, um, mm, so I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so it, I was thinking that, that our awareness, uh, our concepts of God is as big or as small as we desire them to be. How big do you want this perception? to be? How big do you want this awareness to be? And so even, you know, even as we ended this, you know, when we ended our book, the course, when we got to the end, it was telling you, like all teachings do, this is not an ending, but a beginning. And then as you, even as you embark upon this, we sit here and we read the course and we read it over and over again, you know? Um, but, but, but recognize that it's ordained for you to go beyond even that. To, to, I, and I know it's open at the top. It's open at the top because it's open at the top because you're meant to go over the top. You're always meant to expand. And until you, um, and, until you recognize and know absolutely and have that experience of that oneness until you are no longer able to do it, 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 it needs to be. Look at it as if your, your, your task here is to not just learn the meaning of love, but to be love, to manifest love, to vibrate as love, to go beyond even what your perceptions about love is. Because even as I think about love in the sense of me recognizing you as and I as one, I can love me better. I can love me better, so I know I can love you better. I could be better love. I can I can do better love. It's not about how much money I have in my pocket. It's about how much love do I have in my heart? What did I come here to do? Am I saying yes? Am I really fulfilling and living out what I'm supposed to do? And even if I'm not, I'm not being judged by it. I'm not being judged about whether or not I'm doing it. But I know that there is a calling that is saying, come on. Saying yes. Saying, come on, darling. And rooting for me because I know that there is a, a soul expansion going on here. And so as I do that, as oh, oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so I, you know what? I opened up my book like I always do um, because, <laughs> yeah, because that's what I do. And so when I opened up my book, I opened up just because that's what I do. I opened up to the section um, in chapter 15, the holy instant. And it says Christmas as the end of sacrifice right at the top of the page. And so, you know, as always, I have to read for you a little bit out of the course, even though I've read some out of um, Joseph Campbell's, I've got to read for you for a minute because um, I know that Holy Spirit wants me to 
um, to, to read something to you. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so I'm reading out of Christmas as the end of sacrifice. And I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, but I'm going to try to read through it and, um, and react to it as quickly as I can. Fear not to recognize the whole idea of sacrifices solely of your making and seek not safety by attempting to protect yourself from where it is not. Your brother and your father have become very fearful to you, and you would bargain with them for a few special relationships in which you think you see some scraps of safety. Do not try longer to keep apart your thoughts and the thoughts that have been given you. When you are brought together and perceive where they, when they are brought together, and perceive where they are, the choice between them is nothing more than a gentle awakening and as simple as opening your eyes to daylight when you have no more need of sleep. Mm, I love that. That's so poetic. The sign of Christmas is a star, a light in darkness. See it not outside of yourself, but shining in the heaven within and accept it as the sign of the time of Christ that has come. Oh, how often we need to hear that. It is not outside of yourself, but within you. It comes, he comes demanding nothing, no sacrifice of any kind of anyone is asked of him. In his presence, the whole idea of sacrifice loses all meaning, for he is host to God. Mm, he is host to God and you need but invite him in who is there already by recognizing that his host is one and no thought alien to his oneness can abide with him there. Love must be total to give him welcome for the presence of holiness creates the holiness that surrounds it. Mm. Oh, love must be total to give him welcome for the presence of holiness creates the holiness that surrounds it. Mm. No fear can touch the host who cradles God in the time of Christ for the host is as holy as the perfect innocence with which he protects and whose power protects him. This Christmas, give the Holy Spirit everything that would hurt you. Let yourself be healed completely that you may join with him in healing and let us celebrate our release together by releasing everyone with us. Leave nothing behind for release is total. And when you have accepted it with me, you will give it with me. Oh, I love this. All pain and sacrifice and littleness will disappear in our relationship, which is as innocent as our relationship with our Father and as powerful. Pain will be brought to us and disappear in its presence. And without pain, there can be no sacrifice. And without sacrifice, their love must be. Oh, my gosh. What chapter? Um, what chapter? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's chapter 15, uh, section 11, Christmas as the end of sacrifice. You who believe that sacrifice is love must learn that sacrifice is separation from love for sacrifice brings guilt as surely as love brings peace. Guilt is a condition of sacrifices. Peace is the condition for the awareness of the, re of your relationship with God. Mm. I love that. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay, so let me read this and just let me read this one little more part. Through guilt, you exclude your father and your brothers from yourself. Through guilt, you exclude your father and your brothers from yourself. Through peace, you invite them back, realizing that they are where your invitation bids them be. What you exclude from yourself seems fearful for you endow it with fear and try to cast it out though it is part of you. Who can perceive part of himself as loathsome and live within himself in peace? Who can do that? And who can try to resolve the conflict of heaven and hell with in him by casting heaven out and giving it the attributes of hell without experiencing himself as incomplete and lonely. Oh my gosh. And so, yes, you know, yes, yes, yes. It is all within you. All that you desire is already yours. It's already in there. It's already you. So yes, it's, you know, and, and, and here, let us not just look at, because, you know, there is the season of Christmas. 
But when the Course talks about Christmas, it's talking about it like, like every day. Every moment ought to be Christmas because it is the sign, the light in the midst of the darkness, that beacon of light that is shining to you and telling you yes and saying that you're all right and that you're perfectly okay. And if we could get rid of all the guilt that we have, because so many of us have imbued ourselves and not just ourselves, but these bodies that we've had, we imbue them with all this guilt and we make them wretched and seem like they're unacceptable. And in doing that, how can we possibly love ourselves if we see ourselves as wretched and guilty and, and, and somehow unclean because we're in a body? Who could love themselves if that be the case, if that be their awareness? And so at certain point, we have to just drop all of that and know that as you are, as you are, yes, as you are perfect, as you are loved, yes. And so if you see any part of yourself that you would exclude or make guilty, then you have then just disconnected yourself from the very thing that you are meant to experience, the love that you are. And so just stop it, darn it, just stop it. I mean, just, just, just let it go. And so had somebody told me, um, at, you know, when I was younger, that Sandra, you are not guilty. I probably first off wouldn't have believed them, you know, because because life was guilt. I mean, it was so much a part of my existence, this feeling of guilt this feeling of inadequacy, this feeling that I was a sinner, this feeling that I was doing something wrong, that the desires that I had was wrong. It was so much a part of my life, I couldn't even get around it. And you know what, to be honest with you, there are still parts of us that are still in that place where we think guilt is the rule of the day. I mean, if nothing else, we even feel guilty that we're human. And so it becomes this thing of how do we get beyond that? How do we release these ideas? So, so, so some of you will think that the very thing that you desire most is what makes you the most guilty. Some of you are still thinking that without giving up this idea that nobody's judging you, especially not, ah, especially not God. And so once you get beyond this feeling of being judged, yeah, it's the ego. The ego wants you to feel unworthy and unsafe and yes, and separate from God. Yes, the ego wants you to do all that, right? But once you get beyond that, once you get beyond that, then what? Then what? Let's now step into, let's stretch. Let's step beyond the boundaries of where we thought we were. Let's step beyond the boxes that we've lived in for so long. Let's step beyond all of that and see just, just, just how expansive we can get, how much further out there we can get. And, 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 and doing so, let me, and let me say it like this. Doing so from the experience that we're now having, because so often we try to convince each other, one another, that what is in for real for us is not, you know, and so it becomes this thing of it becoming a split in our consciousness because we're trying to say, yeah, this, but not that, and yeah, that, but not this, and, and then Instead of saying, okay, so if where you are is this and this, then, then what? I remember um, when I first started doing radio, I probably shared this guy with you guys before. When I first started doing radio, I used to get on air and I used to try to be, uh, sound so important. I had all these $10 words that I was using and I took my $10 words and I got on air and I was just talking to people and I wanted to, them to think I was so intelligent because I had $10 words. But then somebody came up to me and said, well, you know what? If nobody understands your $10 words, you haven't said a thing. So then I started trading them in for $2 words. And then I thought to myself, well, I got to get so good that every idea that I share, I need to make it so that everybody can understand, whether they're a teenager or, or a 10-year-old or whatever it is. I need to get to the point where I can communicate so well that I can communicate with anybody. Yes, 50-cent words work good, too. 
And so, so that became my endeavor. And then it's like when I started reading Martin Luther King, I'll tell you guys, when I started reading Martin Luther King's work, he had $20 words, okay? He had $20 words. But when he used those $10 words or those $2 words, he made you see pictures with those things. So when he started talking about stuff, it was as if you saw the, the canceled check that he talked about. You heard them when they stamped it with, and it said, non-sufficient funds. You heard and you felt those things on a deeper level. And so it becomes our challenge here is to not sound so important or not make uh, these ideas share complex ideas, but how do we break them down so that they become accessible to all folks? How do we make people know that they are innocent, know that, that they need not live a life in guilt, that they are not their bodies? How do we make an ego real to somebody who can't see an ego? See, that's that's what it's, you know, that's truly, yeah, that's truly what it's all about. How do we simplify things so that everybody, that we democratize this thing of, of, of love, of, of innocence, of acceptance? How do we make everybody understand that? How do we make them, how do we allow them to come into that space? So it becomes a thing. Let me create the space. Let me create the love and then hold the space open so that other folks can come in. Other people can take part in it. And then if they take part in it, then they can invite somebody else and they can invite somebody else. I used to go on air and, and it was funny. I talked about spirituality for years, for years, and I never used the terms God or Jesus or or Holy Spirit, because there was, I know that there is a segment of our population who is, the moment they hear that, they tune it out or they turn it off because they think that something is inherently judgmental and wrong about it. And so I stopped you. I took those words out of my vocabulary. I just plucked them out. And then I started thinking about ways that I can communicate the same ideas and the same truths and the same information without using the words that basically turned people off. How can we then share if, I, if we use the same idea? How can we then share the lessons of the course without turning people off? And, and, and it's not, a, you know, it's not about whether or not you accept this book. It's whether or not you're willing to open yourself to the teaching, to the love that is there beyond what can be taught. Love is beyond what can be taught. How do we then open up? How do we open up? Because these lessons, remember, I always say this, these lessons are life lessons. It's not about any of the stuff. You know, we want to make it about this. Like you've got to, you know, you've got to come down. It's a narrow path and you got to come down this particular way. You know, you got to confess with your mouth that, um, that, that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. It's not about all of that. He came to give you the lesson. He came to give you something. Take what he gave you. Take this fruit from my mouth. Take what it is that I'm trying to give you and go with that. It doesn't matter whether or not it, you know, you got the verbiage or whatever. It's, it, it's, it's, ah, that's what it's all about. At least from my opinion. <laughs> Look, I watched The Good Wife and he's like, from my, in my opinion, that's what it's all about. Really, it's all about that. So, um, Baby Cheese. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so, yes, it's about the intellect. Sometimes intellectual people want to demonstrate their intellectual prowess. That is ego. Yes. And so, yes, that's why I'm saying $2 words work fine. Yes, yeah, so many got beat up with the Bible. Yes, are you are you a humanist? Can we meet people where they are? Yes, yes, yes. And so, 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 like, just, you know, let's, Let's expand into the possibilities um, for for not just for ourselves, but the possibilities for this teaching. How do we make it accessible to all? How do we teach people the same principles? How do we get them to take the candy that we're trying to give them? 
you know, and, and, and recognize that it's good, no matter what they may think, because, because I know a lot of people are, you know, because we've been taught, we've been taught, we've been taught over and over again, um, that, uh, you know, uh, people who are in traditional religions have been taught to stay away from other things, but the truth, whether we learn it wherever we get it, is the truth. And that's one of the reasons why Joel Osteen is so good because he talks about this very same thing without putting a label on it. It doesn't have to, it doesn't need a label. It simply is. Truth simply is. And it needs no defense. It needs no no titles. It needs no all of that stuff. Let's let's take away the barriers and the blocks to our awareness of what is good and what is true for us. Ah, oh, and when, once we do that, yeah, yeah, we'll be in a different spot. You guys, I am, whew. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so I'm going to end this by, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to end on time today. I see that it is now 7.59. So I probably read this particular prayer for you guys before, but I'm going to read it again. Um, this has been Sandra Bishop, in case you didn't know. Um, I'm going to read this prayer. It's actually out of uh, Ernest Holmes, uh, some of Ernest Holmes stuff. It says, today I accept God's gift of prosperity. Today I accept God's gift of love. Today I accept God's gift of whatever. Fill in the blank as you see fit. Today everything I am and have is increased. I identify everything I do with success. I think affirmatively in all my prayers. I accept my love. I accept prosperity. I accept wisdom. I accept whatever. Whatever I need, whenever I need it, wherever I need it, for as long as I need it is always available to me. It's available to you. I no longer see negation, stagnation, or delay in any of our undertakings, but rather I claim that the actions of the living spirit increases everything I do, mm, prospers everything I do, increases every good I possess, and brings success to me and everyone I meet. Everything I think about and do is animated by the divine presence, sustained by the inf infinite power, and multiplied by the divine goodness. You guys, you are totally loved. I see you in perfect health and perfect wholeness. I know that everything you touch just turns to gold. Your life is now prospered and in divine order. I, I'm just so blessed to know you, to be here with you, and I love you. So this has been Sandra Bishop. I'm signing off. I will see you guys again on Wednesday from 7 to 8 right here at the same time. So with that, I'm going to let go of the mic. Oh, Sandra said it dot com uh, on Twitter at Sam Bishop. And uh, you can like me on Facebook forward slash facebook.com forward slash Sandra Thrives. All of that good stuff wherever um, I love you. And I will see you on Wednesday. So be blessed. See ya.